listening to the Kent Lap Podcast. I read a book called Factory Man. Uh, it's by William Bassett, the furniture guy. You know, Bassett Furniture. Hmm. First hundred pages is about their history, their family history, a lot of gossip, a lot of inter family turmoil, uh, whatever, skip it. But when he starts getting to the part about uh, manufacturing and how it was done, it, it is it was riveting. I could not put the thing down. I would read it till three o'clock in the morning. My wife would say, "You've got to come to bed. Furniture wow. can't be that exciting." Right? I was like, "No, it's not about the furniture. It's about how they did what they did." So this this is cool, and it's it's terrifying. Okay, so you've got a, a furniture manufacturer. They physically own factories. They've got towns that work there. These people have health care. They've got a job. Is it a phenomenal job making one hundred and fifty a year? No, but they've got work. And this little microcosm exists because of this factory. So they make a, let's say, a dresser. And the dresser costs $100 to actually manufacture. Okay? That's materials, labor, and everything. They make it for $100. bucks. well then they're going to turn around and sell it to their dealers for $200. Mm-hmm. Boom. Doubled their profit. They're profitable. Everybody's happy. The dealer takes it, turns around, sells it for $300. Or whatever. These are obviously mm-hmm. just generic numbers. Okay. So then China starts producing and really starts cranking. And why are they doing this? Well, they're an agrarian society. They, they grow things. They don't have a commerce the way we do. They don't have industry the way we do. So that starts cranking. And all of a sudden, someone in the furniture industry gets a hold of, hey, they can build a factory for us and make this stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, now, you're the owner, so this is what you think. I eliminate 1,800 employees, so I don't have the headache to deal with HR. I'm not going to worry about getting sued. I'm not going to worry about people not coming in, production issues. They're gone. Mm-hmm. So you go over to some little town in China. They build you a factory. Now, they say, here's the thing. If you're going to come over here, we'll, we'll produce these, but you have to teach us everything you know. Mm. Everything. From all these trade secrets that you have learned for 150, 250 years. That's part of the deal. In mm. my family, we call that POTD. P-O-T, that's just part of the deal. Part of the deal. That's right. Yes. So in, yeah. in the Haley family, if they say, hey, that's just P-O-T-D. We all know what that <laughs> they means. Know what's up. It's part of the deal, right? <laughs> so if you're going to come over here, that's part of the deal. Yep. Okay. So then you teach them everything you know. So what happened to their learning curve? It wasn't 150 years. It was six months. Mm. They gained in six months what it took you a century to learn mm-hmm. because that's part of the deal. Mm. But what happens is they make that, they now make that uh, same dresser using the same processes that you did, but they can make that for 25 bucks. Right. Now, you put them on a shipping container, send them across the ocean, and you sell them directly to that uh, distributor, mm-hmm. your wholesalers, mm-hmm. okay? You now have none of the costs associated with having a factory. Mm-hmm. You had it made for cheaper than you made it. Yep. You sell it to them for the same price, yep. 200 bucks. So you went from... A hundred dollar cost to twenty five. Mm-hmm. Now you went, and this is, I mean, this is insane. So they buy it, they turn around, sell it. Everybody's happy. But then, the wholesalers find out you scuttled your facility, mm. uh huh, just like you did. Then they go, wait a minute, where are these made? They're not made in X Y Z North Carolina anymore, the furniture capital of the planet. They're made in Guangzhou, China, mm-hmm. or wherever X Y Z China. So then they find out who's making them, and they contact them. Mm. Now, the people that are making them, they don't care who they sell them to. A dresser is a dresser is a dresser. Right. They don't care. They don't play by the same rules that we play by. Yep. So all of a sudden, you go over there, and he, yeah, we'll sell you dress. How much? 25 bucks a shot. Mm-hmm. Now what happened was these wholesalers started taking out the middleman. The very people who used to manufacture the item are now completely unnecessary. And is this, is this, is this, are you talking, is this a scenario here? Or you're saying this happened in this that book you're reading? Happened this actually happened, happened in the book. that yeah. furniture company, it, yes. the book you're reading. So Bassett was the only guy, and they were, he was a pariah. He was vilified in that industry. They beat him down in that industry because he kept saying, guys, you don't understand what's happening. Look at the long game here. Mm-hmm. He even went over to China. He, he started putting his toe in it and mm-hmm. realizing what's happening. I see. And he backed out. Mm. And he couldn't compete. He could not compete with the, the pricing, uh, you know, the manufacturing costs. They mm-hmm. were just a fraction of what... Uh, he, there's a, a story in there that just... Of all the stories, this is the one that got me. 
when they went over to China, he saw a guy with a, the sprayer putting the lacquer finish on the, on the furniture. Over here, you have hazmat suits. You've got special air systems. You've got yeah. filters. You've got everything. We have to have those things. Yeah. And it doesn't uh, pose a, a, an issue or, or a risk, a health risk, to the person that's spraying it. Over there, a guy just picks up and starts spraying it. Mm-hmm. And he says, what, what's going to happen to that guy? He goes, he'll be dead in six months. Golly. He goes, when he's dead in six months, what's going to happen to the sprayer? And the guy, he looks at him confused. He goes, somebody else will pick it up and start spraying. <laughs> Knowing that he's going to be dead in six months, right? Because that's going to feed his family, right? Which I don't fault. I don't fault any uh, uh, country for trying to get ahead. Yeah. But when you want to play on that scale, when you want to be part of the World Trade Organization, when you want to be part of these these the UN, we want, want to be part of these organizations, these world, these global organizations, then level it out. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Is then so? I'm assuming you're a fan of capitalism in general. I am a very big fan of capitalism. Okay, so so what would you say then to the people that say, all right, well, what you just described is capitalism as its finest. You have a group of people here or an entity here that can manufacture a product much more efficiently and with at a much lower cost yes. than this company over here. They should get the business. Would you say to that, okay, I hear you. That's generally the way that it works, and we're fans of that. However, this group is not playing by the same rules as this group over here. And if we just continue to give them all of our business, they're going to wind up with all of the control. They're not playing by the same rules. And there's no way you can compete with that, running these companies out of business, hurting this economy. Like, is that what you would say to it? Or, or what would, um, how, how else would you kind of think through this capitalistic bent that we have and why coming from China is an issue? No, I, I think on, on China's part, it's brilliant. They're, they're gaming the system. They're doing exactly what I would be doing if I were in their shoes. Right. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, you're like, well, no, wait a second. You're talking out of both sides of your mouth. No, it's brilliant. Mm-hmm. So it's our responsibility to make sure that we're holding our opponent's feet to the fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got a book up on your shelf, uh, Tools of Titan, and The Four-Hour Workweek was another one by uh, Tim Ferriss. Mm-hmm. And in there, he talks about winning the, the judo championship. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that story? Uh, I don't. Okay, uh, here's how he won it. I know he did. But... So he gamed the system. He actually read all of the rules lost a ton of weight for weigh-in, gained 20 pounds that week or, or the next day. Within The next day, he's 20 pounds heavier, so it puts him up two or three weight classes. Yeah. And the rules were if you could get your opponent off of the mat, mm-hmm. and he just kept pushing them out. Mm. He didn't know anything about judo. Hmm. He didn't know anything about yeah. it, and he wins. Right. Now, some people say, that's brilliant. I actually think it's brilliant. Yeah. But it is gaming the system. Yep. The rules weren't set up right. Mm. The rules weren't enforced properly. Okay. If you and I are going to play basketball, we have to establish the rules. I see. And so if we're going to establish the rules, then we have to play by the rules. Okay. Okay. So that, that's, help, that's helpful. That actually really helps me because I didn't know much about you, you mentioning tr- Trump. One of the things that he has done that has benefited is getting better roles, essentially better working relationships with China. And when you put it in those terms, that's pretty easy to understand. We have to play by the same rules. So yeah. were we just not, did we just not have our act together when we started entering into trade agreements with China years ago? Or we just let them be too lenient? Or what changed, what is Trump doing to change and have the rules be better for all parties, but certainly our, on our end? Again, it's not a popular answer. Uh, I, I know that there are people that will listen to this podcast and will want to drive their car into a, uh, a, a you know, a ravine when I say this. But he's he doesn't have to. And this is the interesting thing about him. He he and Andrew Jackson are very similar. And and I'm from Nashville. Grew up right, you know, seven miles from the Hermitage. Uh, I've read a lot about Andrew Jackson in my lifetime. The, Andrew Jackson was the first president that didn't owe his candidacy to anyone. Hmm. He was the first person that didn't owe his candidacy to anyone. He truly owed it to the people and nobody else. Hmm. So he didn't have a political machine that could tell him what to do. Interesting. Well, Trump doesn't either. Okay. Nobody can control this guy because he's not in their pocket. I see. He he financed his 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 initial run completely out of his own pocket, hmm. and then when he makes it to the general election, he takes donations. But he makes it very clear, this guy, you're, you're not going to control me. 
Mm-hmm. I am the president, and mm-hmm. I'm going to make the decisions as the president. And you can hate me all you want to. I yep. don't care. Right. Uh, I know he's got thin skin, and he'll say, you know, he makes fun of it. Yeah. Sleepy Jed or whatever, right. or Slow Joe or whatever. Yeah, he does. Sleepy oh, Joe. Sleepy Joe, you know. And there's parts of pe- people hate that. And right. Part of me can't stand it, and I cringe every time he does it. And on the other hand, I absolutely love it. Yeah. Because he doesn't play by the same rules yeah. in terms of not, uh, you know, being in someone's pocket. So mm. you got a guy that says, look... I'm not interested in cutting off China uh, a trade with China. I don't want to cut off trade with anybody. He's smart enough to understand that trade is a good thing. Mm. Mm-hmm. He's a smart enough man to understand that. Uh, but I, he wants to do it fair.